Welcome back to America's Forum. I'm J.D. Hayworth. The United States is sending troops to Eastern Europe, one of its most significant steps yet to reassure NATO allies after Russia's annexation of Crimea. The troops will be sent to Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia in a series of month-long exercises in each of those countries. The Pentagon says the move is a persistent rotational presence that stops short of permanently stationing troops there. The U.S. and NATO insist they will not intervene militarily in the Ukraine. Here to talk about this move and give us our intelligence brief today is the guy who knows all about intelligence. He's intelligent in his own right, but he's also the former chairman of the House uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, Pete Hoekstra of Michigan. Pete, it's so good to have you back on America's Forum. Yeah, how do you respond to an introduction like that? Great to be with you, J.D. Well, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a holdover, and it's not just idle flattery, because obviously, to keep track of all the moving parts, to deal with sensitive information, it takes an intellectual acumen that is, uh, that is valuable in the job you used to hold, and to explain some of this to us, likewise, takes a, a fair amount of brilliance. So we're going to ask you to put on that, uh, that four-cornered cap Pete, uh, and uh, show us your intellectual side. Quite frankly, this move of rotating some 600 troops, uh, starting in Poland and going through the Baltic region, is this the right move by the United States at this juncture? Oh, I think it, it's it's the right move. It's it's a small number. Uh, you know, it, I, I personally would have liked to have seen a larger number, and uh, you know. A, a greater commitment uh, from a military standpoint, you're really putting in place a tripwire. Uh, you know, the best thing we could have done was five years ago put in the anti-missile uh, defense systems into Eastern Europe, uh, but that didn't happen. So now we fall back to these very temporary and very small moves, but uh, they're better than what the Obama administration has been doing. That's not saying a lot, but it says something. So uh, in terms of strategic counterbalance, uh, you say it establishes a tripwire. I, I would gather in terms of our military, it is a useful exercise in terms of a deployment uh, on the Eastern European and on Baltic uh, soil. But Pete, uh, as you might expect, even within the conservative family, there are some disagreements on this. For example, uh, Patrick J. Buchanan joined us yesterday on this program. I'd like you to take a listen to what Pat Buchanan had to say about the Ukrainian crisis. We do not have a military stake in this. We do not have any justification for any kind of military conflict with Russia over Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, or over uh, Crimea. And so those people who are arguing to be sending ships and planes and troops, I'm not with them. Hmm. Well, there's, there's Pat, and of course he wrote the book when we were in Congress and taking some momentous votes in terms of uh, putting troops on the ground in the Middle East. It was Pat Buchanan who wrote the book, A Republic, Not an Empire. And uh, he says, nope, we really don't have much to do. He tries, he cites uh, what he believes to be the, the Reagan doctrine in terms of stopping short, uh, even putting uh, symbolic boots on the ground. So in view of that, uh, what's your analysis of, of the Buchanan uh, approach to uh, this European conflict? Well, I think, uh, Pat, uh, you know, it's always about what questions were asked, what questions were not asked. Uh, the question that was not asked of Pat was, well, what about the Baltics? What about Poland? What about the former Czech Republic? What about Moldova? What about those countries? Does the U.S. have an interest uh, in those? Does Russia have its eyes set on perhaps moving into those territories, or is it satisfied with Crimea and the eastern Ukraine? I don't believe that Putin is satisfied with just Crimea and perhaps a slightly larger territory uh, in eastern Ukraine. I think he has his eyes set on moving into the Baltics and perhaps again extending Russia's influence uh, into a greater Ukraine and, and going further. I think he's going to go as far as he can. So I might agree with Pat that, hey, if all we were talking about is Crimea uh, in parts of eastern Ukraine, at, you know, there's maybe not much rationale for doing anything. But if we believe, and I've talked to the folks, uh, some of the people who are representing and who live in the Baltics uh, and parts of eastern Europe, they're very concerned about Russia's interest 
And so they're thrilled, as small as this step is that the United States is taking, they're thrilled that we're taking it because they do feel threatened. Privately, what are you hearing? And you made mention of this just a second ago, Pete. The, the notion that uh, it should have been missiles on the ground, the missiles that the Obama administration in that ill-fated uh, reset button with the Russian Federation decided to, uh, to uh, prohibit unilaterally from Polish soil and from Eastern Europe. What are you hearing privately from your friends in the Baltics about that? It, given a choice of a symbolic presence of troops or those genuine missiles on the ground, which would they prefer? Well, they would have preferred the development and the deployment of the missiles five years ago. You know, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum, and it doesn't happen in a single period of time. It happens over a long period of time. You know, when these countries became independent in 1993, when they started to embrace market economies, when they started to embrace, uh, you know, elections and those types of things, they were moving in the right direction. President Bush, by promising the deployment of the missile defenses, you know, it was a continuation of those steps. But in reality, what happened in 2004, 5, 6, and then in uh, 2009, when President Obama pulled back on the missiles, what we've seen is really that process has stopped, which has given this opportunity for the Russians. You know, these countries are still energy dependent on Russia. They are still, they can still be intimidated uh, by the Russian military regime, and they have not been fully integrated economically uh, into the West. All of that over the last five to seven years is what has now provided this opportunity for Russia to go into that vacuum. Now, Pete, while the eyes of the world have been on the Baltics and on the Ukraine and, and Eastern Europe, our president has shifted his focus and his physical presence to Asia. Now in Tokyo, part of this, this trip to uh, do what his uh, administration officials uh, call uh, a, a re-pivot to Asia and to emphasize what is happening uh, in what I guess we could call the Pacific Theater. Now, when we take a look at what is transpiring with this particular trip uh, to Asia, what what is the president saying uh, to his counterparts in that part of the world? Well, it's not again as much JC or JD what he says. It is what they see. What they see is a weak America globally. And what they're seeing now in Asia is they're seeing a very, very resurgent China that is, I think this year they're going to invest 12% more in real spending or in spending that they're identifying to the West uh, and publicly and a 12% increase in defense spending. These countries are wor very worried about, quote unquote, the Obama doctrine of reset, reset, reset. Uh, and they've not seen a successful one yet. So they're going to be very, and you know, with what you're seeing with China expanding and making statements about the South China Sea, they're very concerned. They are much more dependent on a strong America than what Western Europe and Eastern Europe are. They have really no military capabilities at all. And if they see a weak or an indecisive America over a period of time, they're very concerned about how that will embolden China. Pete, about a minute and a half left, and we, we touched on this before, but it just naturally comes up when you're talking about China. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel on a trip to China, uh, as I understand it, basically said, hey, we'll share all our information with you on cyber warfare, even as the Chinese are running daily cyber attacks on what transpires at the Pentagon. We continue these military exchanges. The Chinese, of course, with their first aircraft carrier, I believe their, their ambition uh, over the next uh, half century is to make the Pacific into a big lake that they will dominate. What, what is the rationale for helping the Chinese but depriving our allies in, in Eastern Europe? Uh, it, it makes absolutely no sense. You know, the, uh, the one thing you can say about cyber is, well, you might as well cooperate with the Chinese on cyber. They're stealing it all anyway. Uh, they're attacking us on a daily basis, like you said. Uh, but, you know, there were press reports out again, and we were briefed on this when I was still on the Intelligence Committee, 
Uh, the Chinese are doing everything that they can to integrate into our universities, into our research universities, to steal the most valuable stuff that we have, which is intellectual property, before it's ever even become commercialized and patented. That's mm. what they're doing in our universities. They're attacking our businesses on, da on a daily basis to steal intellectual property from our business community. Uh, and why we're cooperating and sharing with them everything that we know about cyber makes absolutely no sense. They are an enemy on cyber. Well, Pete Hoekstra, we appreciate uh, your candid speech about what's going on in so many troubled areas of the world. Uh, where do you feel about China, friend or foe? We'd love to have your comments. You can check in via Twitter at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum.